As we look tonight at the topic of Paul's faithful sayings, we're going to concentrate tonight on four specific passages that our good brother Paul writes and records for us that has that phrase, faithful saying, in them. But as we go into this lesson, I want to remind you that these, uh, this statement or this phrase, faithful saying, our good brother Paul was not placing <laughs> emphasis on these four statements as being of more importance than any of the rest of the message that is recorded for us. If we go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, I want you to notice verse 37. In that passage, Paul writes, If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things which I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. So as we look at these four sayings tonight, four verses or four passages, let us understand that all that Paul wrote were the commandments of God. I believe when he uses this term faithful saying, He's trying to make an emphasis to us about these passages and show us, and really when you look at them after we go through them, I think you're going to see, these are really passages that deal with first principles. They are fundamental passages that we build upon in our faith as we live our life on this earth. So let's begin in 1 Timothy chapter 1. In verse number 15. There Paul writing to Timothy. He says this is a faithful saying. And worthy of all acceptance. That Christ came into the world to save sinners. Of whom I am chief. As I look at this passage. As he writes to the young man Timothy. Here is Paul giving a recollection if you will, of his own conversion. And logically to me, as I put the pieces of the first epistle of Timothy together, I understand that what Paul is trying to do is to give Timothy encouragement and to let him know how thankful he is because of the change that took place in his life. You know, on Wednesday nights, we've been studying from the book of Acts and chapter 9. And we see that as Paul, as Saul, is journeying toward Damascus, he has no intent to become a Christian. He has no intent to become a follower of Christ. For he was going to Damascus with letters in hand to bind, to persecute, to imprison, and even possibly to put to death those who were Christians. And so as I see this statement that he makes, it is a faithful saying when Paul recognized and remembered back to his condition you notice at the end of that verse, he says, of whom I am chief. I think in Paul's mind, he thought himself to be the worst of the worst. He was the lowest of lows when it came to this concept of being a sinner. And I think maybe even today, you and I, as we go through our life, we might think to ourselves, I'm not worthy of being forgiven. I've committed all these great sins. But that's not what Paul says. Paul says he considered himself to be the chief, the worst 
of all sinners. But brethren, guess what? God saved him. God offered him salvation. And Paul, or Saul at the time, <coughs> accepted the extension of that salvation. Paul was reminding Timothy that he had been saved because of Christ Jesus. He acknowledges and understands that in his ministry, he teaches the simple fact that Jesus came into the world to save sinners. What were the words of Jesus himself in the book of Luke? Jesus says that he came to what? Seek and save that which was lost. What did it cost for Jesus to save the lost? Did it not cost him his life? Did it not cost him his life upon that cruel cross of Calvary? Where he was beaten, where he was abused. Paul says, Christ died. He came to save sinners. And, brethren, when I see that Paul says this is a faithful saying, he's telling us that we must acknowledge that Christ came. And I believe Christ expressed purpose in coming was to save us from our sin. Saying number two, we flip over to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, and we look at verse 11. He says, this is a faithful saying, for if we died with him, we shall also live with him. This dying and living with Him is something that is shown, and I know I have up there uh, Romans chapter 6, beginning there, verse 3, down to verse 11. But let's, let's think of this in another sense. We'll look at that in a moment. But let's go back and remember Christ gave His life for us, right? He was physically put to death on the cross. We know that he was laid in a borrowed tomb. And on the third day, he burst forth triumphantly from that grave. Therefore, as Paul is saying here, if we died with him, we shall also live with him. When we go back and we look at Romans chapter 6, we understand that we are buried with Him in baptism. When we go down into the waters of baptism, that is our putting to death the old man of sin and sorrow. That would be for us the equivalent of what Paul says when he says, I am crucified with Christ. We are accepting his sacrifice as we go down into the waters of baptism. But as we go down into the water, at what point at what point are we buried like he was? Is it when all of my body but my head goes under the water? I see some head shaking. No. Is it when every part of my body goes under the water except my forehead? When I am buried with Him, I am fully submerged under 
the water. Questions. <coughs> when Christ was buried in the borrowed tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, at what point was he completely buried? <coughs> because some people will argue, Brother Ray, he was never buried because he was never completely covered. Well, I disagree with you. Chip, when Christ was buried in the borrowed tomb, <coughs> they slid the rock halfway across the entrance. No. He, he wasn't completely buried. Well, all right, I'll give you that. How about if they slid it and left a quarter inch gap? He's still shaking his head. At what point was Christ fully <coughs> buried, fully immersed in the depths of the earth? Was it not when the rock slid all the way? And by the way, it's recorded for us when Christ was buried, they, uh, Brother Kenny, my memory is right, does it not say they sealed the tomb? Amen. That is when Christ was fully immersed in the earth. And they put a guard there. We began to put the man, old man of sin to death as we are being lowered into the waters of baptism. We are buried as Christ was when we are fully submerged in the waters of baptism. Well, what about this aspect of being resurrected we know how we can die with him. How do we live with him? Well, my memory from Romans chapter 6 says that when we come up out of the waters of baptism, we rise to walk in newness of life. When Christ came forth from the grave on the third day, Was his body the same as it was when he was put into the grave? Important that we understand that when he was resurrected, his physical body was different. Which symbolizes for you and for me, according to what Paul's writing here in this faithful saying, is that you and I, when we rise from the waters of baptism to walk in a newness of life, we recognize that that old man has been crucified and buried and that a new man comes forth from the grave. We have a different mindset, a different mentality of how we approach life. Just as Christ's physical body was different, our spiritual mindset must be different. So in order for us to live with Him, we've got to be dead with Him. Go back and think about Paul. Is that not what he did to obtain salvation? Did he not put the old man of sin and sorrow, the persecutor, did he not put that behind him when he was told to arise and be baptized and wash away his sin, calling on the name of the Lord in Acts 22? Did Paul obey the words of God that were spoken through Ananias? Did he do that? He did. He put to death the old life he was living and he began to live a new life. He became a proclaimer. He changed because he knew in order to live with Christ, he had to be dead with Christ. Jesus came to the world to save sinners. 
The second saying, those who die with Christ, they're the ones who are going to be saved. So the next two of these sayings, they're going to be directed towards those who have already put Christ on and obtained salvation. We go back to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 4. And we begin reading in verse number 7. 1 Timothy chapter 4 beginning in verse 7. But reject profane and old wives fables and exercise yourself rather to godliness. For bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. Here in these three verses, a contrast is going to be made between physical exercise and spiritual exercise. Now, the text doesn't use that phrase, spiritual exercise, does it? But godliness and practicing godliness is exercising the mind to do things we ought to do as a Christian. And I like it, and, and, and I have to agree. There is some profit associated to physical exercise. How many of you have gone to the doctor? And the doctor says, you know, you might feel better about yourself and your health might be better if you would do a little bit of exercise. And maybe by doing exercise, you're going to lose a little bit of weight. Well, I was told that I need to keep an eye on my weight. So I'm just trying to get the belly out there where I can see it. Not be very successful. <laughs> Physical exercise <coughs> is good. I, will, I won't say it's not. <coughs> but brethren, he goes on and he says, Godliness is profitable for all things. That tells me that exercising my mind towards godliness is more important than physical exercise. Doing what God asks us to do, doing what God has commanded us to do in His Word, it is profitable, notice it says, for all things. And the contrast is very stark in these two. Physical exercise is profitable, but for a time. Godliness, it says, is profitable for today and for our future. It is good in this life we live physically, but it is more important that it holds the promise for life to come. If we go over to 2 Peter, in chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1, begin in verse 5. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, and to faith, virtue, virtue, knowledge, knowledge, self-control, self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, the brotherly, the godliness, brotherly kindness, and the brotherly kindness, love, the Christian graces, as we have named that passage. Notice it says, For if these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short sighted. Even the blindness is in forgotten that he was purged from his old sin. Therefore, brethren, be more diligent to make your calling and election sure. 
For if you do these things, you will never stumble. You notice godliness is right smack in the middle of those. Every one of those things, the first ones point to godliness, and the ones that follow godliness point back to godliness. Those are all forms of godliness. All things that we need to do in our life that will profit us in this life and in the life to come. And that's why I believe Paul sums it up and closes out in verse 9 and says that this is a faithful saying. But very closely associated with the third one, we go over to the book of Titus. And we look at chapter 3 and look at verse number 8. Paul here again writing to the young preacher Titus. He says, this is a faithful saying. And these things I want to affirm constantly that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to all men. Paul, what are you saying? Paul is telling us that good works have value. Good works are good and they are profitable to men. If we go back to the book of Acts and we think about what is said about Jesus, the scripture says that he went about <coughs> seeking to do what? Good. Oh. Brother Eric, are, are you saying that you and I, we must be as Jesus was yet? The Bible says that he left us a perfect example that we should follow in his steps. So Paul is reminding Titus that maintaining good works is important. That we ought to be reaching out and doing good to others. If we go back over to go back to chapter 2 of the book of Titus and look at verse 14. He gave who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people. Zealous of good works. What does it mean to be zealous of good works? To me, that word zealous means we ought to be in, it, um, in pursuit, always looking for a way to do good unto our fellow man. I promise you, brother, when you walk out those doors tonight, if you look for an opportunity to do good, you will find it. That is what I see that meaning of the word zealous is. It is always on our mind. What can I do to help someone else who is truly in need? And as I look at <coughs> chapter 3, verse 8, and then I drop down to Titus 3 and look at verse 14. And let our people also learn to maintain good works. To me, urgent need. <coughs> Pay close attention to the last verse. That they may not be unfruitful. Good works produce fruit. Fruit produces more pressure. The more we sow, the more fruit that will come forth. So here you have four sayings. Three written to Timothy. One written to Titus. I suggest to you tonight that these four passages, they deal with things of utmost importance. The question is, have we, have you, allow 
allowed Jesus to save him by your dying to him. I'll illustrate that this Do you and I have the same attitude that Jesus had as he was praying in the garden? The true test of dying to self and living for Jesus is found in the phrase that he says to the Father. If there is any other way let this cup pass from me. Y'all know the rest of the country. Nevertheless, not my will be done, but thy will be done. Dying to Christ and allowing him to truly save us is our saying, it's not my will anymore. It's your will. What would you have me to do for you. How about our exercise? Are we exercising <coughs> our minds to godliness? If we are exercising our minds to godliness, surely, Brother Ray, that will lead me to do the good works and to maintain the works that I know I should be doing as a Christian. Tonight we have one among us. <coughs> who needs to respond to the Lord's invitation. Maybe it's one whose ear has not heard the body of Christ, and you are ready to begin that walk. You're ready to follow these faithful saints. You can do that tonight by putting Christ on in baptism. Or if you've done that and your life has not been what it should be, you have the opportunity to come home and make things right. Repenting of sin, confessing those sins. Will you let us pray with you and pray for you? We all will get to heaven. And it takes each other to get there. Tonight, if you have a need to respond to the invitation, I pray to come. We'll all stand. We'll all stand.